Hi Year 10, um, a bit of a sort of in-between lesson today. We've come to the end of algebra and um, I'm afraid not all the algebra at GCSE but this particular section of algebra uh, and we're about to move on to a new topic. Um, I just want to do a couple of sort of finishing off type questions before we leave algebra and then I also today want to sort of introduce the next topic and get us going on that. Um, I'm not really planning to do an end of unit test but I might towards the end of next week set a little sort of summary homework, only short, uh, just looking at some of the key techniques from the algebra topic. I'm conscious that your books are sitting in my cupboard um, and uh, I hope you can understand that you know if we, uh, if we posted home everyone's exercise book from every subject that would probably bankrupt the school so I'm you know, that's one of the reasons I'm sort of resisting doing an end of unit test. Anyway, here's a starter question for you. I hope after the last couple of lessons that we've done you could answer these two questions. So with this one here, you are going to hopefully divide by minus five. Um, and then it's asking about integer values. And then this one, a little bit more straightforward to solve, but then you've got to show it on a number line and write it using set notation. Pause and have a go. OK, so with this one, I divided by minus five. And because that was a negative number, I had to flip the signs. So minus 10 divided by minus 5, minus divided by minus gives you positive, so that's 2. And 5 divided by minus 5 is minus 5. And, and this statement makes sense. Uh, x is smaller than 2, but bigger than minus 5, bigger than or equal to minus 5. But we tend to have these double inequalities, the signs facing the other way. So you might have chosen to rewrite it that way. So in terms of integer, sol integer solutions, x is between minus 5 and 2. It can be minus 5, but it can't be 2. So I'm hoping this was your list of integer solutions. Um, with this one here, I added 3 to here and here as well as here. So number line would look like this and open dot at zero and a closed dot at nine. Joined up, so I should have my ruler ready, there we go. And set notation, well, I seem to remember saying, um, I've never seen a, a question with a double inequality and set notation, here we are, here's one. So curly brackets, x colon, and I'm just gonna put that statement. Any brackets at the end. Thanks for those that submitted their inequality questions from Friday. Clearly most of you don't have the same problem with set notation I do. You are coping with that very well indeed. Um, good stuff. Now because the majority of this topic was based around quadratic equations, we did all that before Christmas. Um, so I just thought I would finish with a couple of quadratic equation questions. I don't mean finish the lesson, I mean finish our algebra topic. So here's an example. Um, my daughter's age in three years time will be the square of her age three years ago. How old is she now? Well this is a problem with a value that we don't know. We don't know how old she is now so I'm going to give that a letter. Um, I could use x, I'm going to use a for age. So I'm going to try and write an equation for this sentence here. My daughter's age in three years time. Well, if she's eight years old now, I can write that. So I'm going to put an expression for that here. And we saw will be, will be equal to the square of her age three years ago. So on this side, I'm going to write the square of her age three years ago in algebra. Now, some of you will be scratching and thinking, what on earth are you going on about? Have a think about that. Just pause it briefly and I'll come back with my answer to that in just a second. My daughter's age in three years time will be the same as her age three years ago, a minus three squared. The square of her age means squared. So that's my equation. Now, I'm now going to grid this side out 
and that's going to give me an a squared and some assorted other algebra and then I'm going to line it up so I have a quadratic on this side and zero there and when I say I'm going to do that I'm going to pause and ask you to have a go at it see how far you can get we're going to solve it in a moment but see if you can get to the quadratic that we need to solve first I'm sure I've said before, if you just run these videos from beginning to end, you'll never have a chance to think for yourself. So please make sure you are pausing as at the points I suggest. So I'm hoping you gridded that out and then you peanutted and you got a squared minus 6a plus 9. OK, and so we know that this is equal to that. So this is equal to that. These two are the same thing. I then, because it's a quadratic equation, know I want zero on one side, and because I've got most things on this side, I'm going to go for zero here. So I'm going to take away an A and take away three from both sides. I did that in one go. Hope that was all right. So I took away an A, so I already had minus six A, so that's minus seven A. And I took away three, so that made the nine into six. I'm going to solve this equation now. Um, you could have used the formula. A is one, B is minus seven, C is six. Actually, this one factorizes quite nicely. If I gridded that out, it would give me this, because you'd have minus 6 times minus 1 giving you plus 6, and you'd have minus 6a minus 1a. So my two solutions are So, have we got two possible answers? Well, I hope you can see that uh, we haven't, because she can't be 1 now, because this question talks about 3 years ago. So we haven't made a mistake, it's just that's not a valid answer. Let's just test with a is 6. So in three years' time, she's going to be 9. Three years ago, she would have been 3, and 3 squared is 9. Yes, that works. That works. It also works if we make a equal to 1, but you can't be minus 2 years old. So, uh, so she is 6 years old now. Let's try another question that leads to a quadratic equation. Now this is a, a particularly sort of popular sort of question. Um, it looks like a, a geometry, it looks like an area question, but actually it's a quadratic equation question. So it says the football pitch in the diagram, here we are, has an area of 7,140 metres squared. What are its dimensions? How long is it and how wide is it? We don't know how long and how wide it, they are, but we know that it's equal to some missing value 4x plus 5 along the length and 3x minus 7 along the uh, the width. And I know that to find the area of a rectangle, I do length times width. So what we know is that 4x plus 5 times 3x minus 7, and I write that like that, equals 7, 1, 4, 0. Oh. So I'm hoping that you know where to go now. I'm hoping you're going to grid that out and then once you've gridded it, gridded it out you're going to write that and then you're going to take away 7140 to give a zero there and then we're going to try and solve it so go on see if you can get to the point where we need to solve it right so hopefully when you gridded it out this is a complicated gridding out so just pause and make sure you got it right three x times four x numbers and letters separately so three times four is 12 x times x is x squared three x times five is 15 x uh, four x times minus seven is minus 28 x and seven times minus five remember we're in multiplying is minus 35 x when you peanut uh, you've got 15 x's take away 28 x's which is minus 13 x's so we get this rather horrible looking quadratic if i then take away 7140 from both sides minus 35 take away another 7140 gives you 7175 and i was hoping i have to say when i set this one that at this point we'd be able to divide by something to make it a whole lot easier no -uh. unfortunately no now it probably is one that you can factorise, but uh, I'm going to use the formula. Now I already know I'm going to have to deal with some pretty big numbers. Um, I need to be really careful. I remember that b is minus 13. So uh, go on, see if you can um, 
a reminder of the formula again. See if you can get somewhere with that. You're going to have to use a calculator. Hopefully you are, have access to some sort of calculation device, whether it's your own calculator or on a phone. See how far you can get with that. OK, so I can't sugarcoat this. It's not particularly pretty. So I start with minus b, which is 13, because b is minus 13. Plus or minus, minus 13 squared is plus 169. Minus 4ac, 4ac I always put in brackets, so that's 4 times 12 times minus 7175. The bracket multiplies out to give me this. 16 minus minus that, we are adding. And fortunately, when I square rooted that, I got a whole number. I was worried we we're going to have some horrible decimal to deal with. So actually, it's not as bad as all that. We end up with 13 plus or minus 587 divided by 24. Now you might think I'm being a bit lazy here because I've only bothered doing 13 plus 587 divided by 24. I wonder if you can decide why I didn't bother with the 13 minus 587 divided by 24. Well, don't forget what x is. x is involved in the calculation of the length and the width of this football pitch. Now, if I did 13 minus 587 divided by 24, that's going to be a negative answer. The length of a football pitch can't be negative. So I know, just like the previous question, that one of the two answers I get isn't valid. It doesn't mean I've made a mistake. It just means that that answer is nonsense. So x is 25. We haven't finished that, have we? Because what we then need to do is work out the dimensions of the pitch. So x is 25. So 4 lots 25 at 100. So you've got 105 metres by uh, 3 lots of uh, 25 is 75. Take away 7. Uh, that's uh, 68 metres. Because football pitches are um, they're not standard length. You are have a, a, a range of acceptable values for the length and the width. Um, 105 seems quite long to me, I have to say. 68 seems quite wide, actually. I mean, I know um, Anfield is famously wide, um, but uh, yeah, I think I'd be surprised if even Anfield was that wide. Anyway, uh, that was the answer to that question. Now, I haven't done those questions at the end just to sort of scare you. Um, I wanted to sort of Bring it back full circle as we started by solving quadratic equations i thought it was good to finish these skills though that we've learned the quadratic equations the simultaneous equations the inequalities they crop up again through the course so um, it's it's you know, the first time we've met them a lot of them anyway has been now but it's quite nice because they keep popping up and we get to practice them again good stuff let's move on to our new topic though now i'll be honest with you um you know, that algebra topic is, is tough. It's tough. I think it's, I think it's good fun. I enjoy teaching that sort of algebra, but I know it's tough. And I know a lot of you have worked really, really hard at it. Um, the next topic we're coming to is the next step in probability. I love probability. I think it's, um, I think it's good fun. Uh, it, uh, it's really useful for A-level. Um, and I suspect you're going to find it a little bit more accessible, a bit easier than the algebra we've been doing. So I'm um, having done a little bit of preamble, we're sort of two thirds of the way through the lesson. This is my objective for the lesson. I just want to set us up for the work we're going to do on probability by just looking at a couple of questions, which I'm hoping you can do based on previous knowledge. There's a handout attached on class charts. You don't have to print it out, but it just uh, it's got this table and it's got a, a blank for the next question just to save you having to draw them out. Not all of you got printers and some of you would rather do your notes in your um, whatever paper you're writing on, but that's absolutely fine. So here's the first question. This is a two way table. You've got to complete the table. It's a survey where a number of boys and girls were asked about whether or not they wore glasses. And um, you've got to complete the table. And then you've got a probability question or two probability questions to answer. So I'm not going to do any sort of explanation of this. I'm hoping that you'll be able to do this on your own. Pause the video. Have a go. OK, I hope you were able to fill that in. I like these. Um, you know, you need to decide where to start. I started here. So 18 and something makes 32. That's 14. Once I knew that was 14, I knew that was 4. 
points. I knew that was four, I knew that was 10. I also knew uh, you could have started here because if that's 18 and that's six, that's 12, that's 22, 32 altogether. Uh, this is called a two-way table and there's always two ways of checking you got it right because these two numbers and these two numbers have to add up to 32. Um, we pick someone at random so everyone has an equal chance of being picked. So with 32 students these answers are both going to be fractions out of 32. We couldn't do that if someone was more likely to be picked than someone else but because we're told they're being picked at random then equal chance. Boy without glasses, so we've got 10 of those, so that's 10 over 32, which um, I hope you would simplify to 5 over 16. And a girl, we've got 18 of those, so that's 18 out of 32, uh, which is 9 out of 16. Okay, so uh, th th this is just a reminder about probability being very, very easy when you have equally likely outcomes. So that's why we often talk about rolling dice, flipping coins, picking a card at random from a pack, or in this case, picking a person at random. In those cases, probability is really easy. You can just write down the probability as a fraction. So here's the last question I thought we'd do today is this little, little introduction to probability. Um, you've got a spinner with 10 sections. We're assuming, therefore, that uh, when you spin it, each of the sections has got an equal chance of being the one it lands on. They're all the same size. You've got to put a number in each section. You can use one, two or three as many times as you like. And you need to do it so that some conditions are true. And this is a reminder about the notation we use for probability. This means the probability of getting an odd number. So what we need is the probability of getting an odd number to be greater than the probability of getting an even number. So however you set your spinner out, odd numbers need to be more likely than even numbers. And the probability of getting a 1 needs to be twice as much as the probability of getting a 3. That's what that, that notation means. So hopefully you can work out what that means in terms of the 1s and 3s. Now there isn't one unique answer to this. That's why on the handout, if you're using a handout, I think I gave you a couple of, of copies of it. Um, but go on, have a go. See if you can put 1s, 2s and 3s in those sections so that these two conditions are satisfied. Have a pause and have a go. Now I have to say, I find this statement really hard to get my head around. I, I'm always struggling to work out whether I need more 1s or more 3s. The probability of getting a 1 is twice the probability of getting a 3. So it's more likely to get a 1. So I need more 1s twice as many ones as three. So I had two threes and four ones. Uh, that meant in total I had six odd numbers. I filled in the rest with twos, so there were four even numbers, so this was also true. Probably getting an odd number is six out of ten, three fifths, even number, four out of ten, two fifths. Now I don't know if you did the same as me, um, or whether you did it differently. Um, have a think about whichever way. If you did it differently, it might be that my way um, is the only other way of doing it. But just have a think. Are there other options that we could consider for this problem? Last question. Pause and have a go. So I'm using a different colour for a different go. If I have one three, that means I'd have to have two ones because the probability of getting a one is twice the probability of getting a three. And that means the rest will have to be twos. So I'd have seven two, so this condition would no longer be true. So I can't have one three. We already know you can do it with two threes. What about if I had three threes? So that would mean I would need six ones, because the probability of one needs to be twice the probability of three. So one, 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 one. And that would leave the remaining one as a two. Now, does that still work? It does, doesn't it? The probability of 1 is twice the probability of 3, and you are far more likely, in this case, 9 out of 10 to get an odd number, than 1 out of 10 to get an even number. Now, what about 4 threes? Well, if you had 4 threes, you would need 8 ones. There aren't enough ones. So we had two possible answers there. Well done if you got both of them. OK, so uh, that's Monday's lesson done. We're going to move on then with probability, nothing to submit for today, 
and um, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.